So hi everyone, today is February 25th, 2024. Uh, welcome to this first session of My Uye, a series of monthly interviews with very special guests whom I'll be introducing shortly, but who is usually referred to as the People's Historian. The My Uye series will be exploring issues that are at the core of contemporary anti-colonial, anti-imperialist and pan-African struggles, namely settler colonialism, black internationalism, resistance of enslaved Africans, revolutions and counter-revolution, class collaboration, imperialism, white supremacy, among other topics. Today's session will be dedicated to the life and legacy of one of the greatest revolutionaries of the 20th century, if not of all times, Paul Leroy Robeson. The My Year series is, is co-sponsored by the Pan-African League Moja, the, organiza the organization I belong to, mm -hmm. the All African People's Revolutionary Party, the Black Alliance for Peace, the Movimiento Pan-Africanista Cuarta Internacional de Arbeista, and Activist News Network. So before introducing to our guests, uh, before introducing our guests to the audience, sorry, I would like to welcome my co-host, so Leonardo Moshe of the All African People's Revolutionary Party, who's joining us from uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. Hi, Leonardo. Leonardo, if you can hear us. Greetings to everyone. Yes, thank you. Uh, so today we are honored and privileged to be joined by a very, very special guest. Our guest is a historian, longtime political activist in anti-racist, pan-Africanist, and working class struggles. He holds the Moots Professorship of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He is one of the most prolific authors of our time. He has written over 40 books on a wide range of issues, including uh, Black internationalism, um, the music and film industry, imperialism, class struggles, settler colonialism, and white supremacy. His latest books include Revolting Capital, Racism and Radicalism in Washington, D.C., 1900-2000, Acknowledging Radical Histories, Conversation with Chris Steele. He also has two forthcoming books in 2024, I Dare Say, a collection of his works, which I believe will be out next month, Armed Struggle, Question Mark, Panthers and Communists, Black Nationalists and Liberals in Southern California, Touring 60s and 70s, a book that is expected by the summer. Our guest is also the co-producer of Freedom Now, a weekly Pan-African internationalist and anti-imperialist program which airs on KPFK 90.7 FM on Saturdays at 11 a.m. Pacific and can also be found on at kpfk.org and on Activist News Network YouTube channel. Trained as a lawyer, he has been at the forefront of the anti-apartheid movement in the United States, especially during his time as the president of the National Conference of Black Lawyers in the 1980s. And this also explains why to those who are still wondering why the program is titled Maibuye, indeed Maibuye was the name given to a series of protests and demonstrations led by the African National Congress in 1952. And Maibuye Africa, which means Come Back Africa, was also a catchphrase and popular song during the entire apartheid struggle. Our guest has received several awards, including the 2021 American Book Award for the Dawning of the Apocalypse, The Roots of Slavery, White Supremacy, Settler Colonialism, and Capitalism in the Long 16th Century, in the France Fanon Lifetime Award granted by life, sorry, France Fanon Lifetime Achievement Award, Award granted by the Caribbean Philosophical Association in 2023. And finally, regarding the topic that will be discussed today, our guest is the author of uh, this biography of Paul Robeson, Paul Robeson, the Artist of Revolutionary, which is also available in, in French. Uh, he's also penned a chapter on um, uh, the political and personal work of Paul Robeson, which was published in this book that was uh, released in 1998 uh, to commemorate the uh, century of the birth of Paul Robeson. And Paul Robeson is also the main character of two other books uh, published by our guest. So White Supremacy Confronted, this book, uh, U.S. Imperialism and Anti-Communism versus the Liberation of Southern Africa from Road to Mandela. And finally, um, Communist Front, the Civil Rights Congress, 1946-1956. So Dr. Jerohon, that's the name of our guest. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. I, I'm certainly appreciative. And let me also say that the book, I Dare Say, is out. Oh, um, okay. I have a copy in the back if I All right. can, momentarily. And I should also say I'm speaking to you from Honolulu, Hawaii. Yes. I'm researching a book on the roots of U.S. imperialism. Uh, that is to say, the United States overthrew 
the Hawaiian kingdom in the 1890s, which was a, a real counter-revolutionary blow and a blow against progress, and then incorporated it as a colony, and then the 50th state by 1959, although to coin a phrase, I dare say, I do not expect Hawaii to be part of the United States by the end of this century, if not sooner. Oh, wow. Uh, in any case, uh, perhaps I should just begin talking about Paul Robeson, or do you want to ask me a question before? Yeah, I... we have a list of questions that we'll be asking you, so I'll start with the first one. Uh, so I wanted to start a discussion with a confession. I didn't know who Paul Robeson was until I read your book. That was uh, two years ago, so I actually read it in French. Uh, so I was in the library looking for something else, actually, and I came across the book. I know there's an, a saying in English which say, would say that you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but I actually was first attracted to the book by its cover, which I'm showing here, which I found really attractive. And uh, as I was reading the book, I um, and started learning that, um, so the book, The Artists Are Revolutionary, uh, I started learning that uh, Paul Robeson at that time was uh, the best known American in the world, which is the title of the first chapter of your book. Uh, but he was also in him going to quote directly from, from your book. And so I'm quoting Dr. Hohn's book, uh, The Artists Are Revolutionary, that Paul Robeson was, quote, the forerunner of the likes of Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King. In fact, one cannot begin to understand the lives and trajectories of those two men without considering Robeson. That's the, on the very first page of the book. You also argue that you cannot fully appreciate how the Jim Crow system came to an end without an understanding of the life of Paul Robeson. Robeson pioneered the struggle against Jim Crow throughout the 1930s and 1940s. It was only with Robeson's fall that King and Malcolm could emerge as they did. The undermining of Robeson created a vacuum that these two leaders filled. Then comparing Paul Robeson with contemporary figures that the young generation is more likely to be familiar with, you also write, as a singer and actor, he was as celebrated as Michael Jackson and Denzel Washington would be. As an athlete, he was an illustrious, he was as illustrious, sorry, as Mario Balotelli. I guess today would liken him to Leon Bappe. And as an activist, he carried the moral weight of Nelson Mandela. So after reading this, I, I started wondering how come uh, I have never heard of such an important historical figure. And when I started asking people around me, including people who are in an African organization, activists, I realized that most of them had no clue. So I guess my first question, which will be in two parts, would be, how do you account for the fact that Paul Robeson is unknown to many of the people who he has his, uh, sorry, how, come, how do you account for the fact that Paul Robeson is unknown to many of the people he has sacrificed his life for? Is it fair to conclude that the attempts to bury his legacy have been quite successful? This is only a hypothesis. And then uh, why is it so important for people of African descent, and there are many in this uh, lecture today, why is it so important for people of African descent to study the life and legacy of Paul Robeson? Well, thank you for that question. Um, with regard to the dearth of knowledge today about Paul Robeson, I think it is partially due to the fact that he is seen as a negative example from the point of view of imperialism and capitalism. Secondly, uh, Paul Robeson was hostile to anti-communism, defined himself as an anti-fascist, and given the role of the United States globally in terms of promoting world imperialism, not to mention promoting capitalism, and of course, uh, smiling upon anti-communism, it's no accident that an individual like Paul Robeson would have his example buried to a certain extent. But let me begin by talking about who Paul Robeson was and providing a snapshot and an overview of his life which then will provide a platform for further probing into his legacy. Uh, Paul Robeson was born in 1898 in New Jersey, USA, uh, died in 1976 in Philadelphia, USA. Uh, in between, he was a stellar student at Rutgers University in New Jersey, his home state, where he also excelled, excelled in sports, including uh, US football, baseball, 
track and field, basketball, et cetera. From there, he moved on to law school at Columbia University in New York City and graduated from law school and seemed well on his way to becoming a comfortable member of a rather small black middle class. But what happens is that the woman that he was to marry, speaking of as Londa Robeson, uh, pushed him into the arts. He first gained renown as a singer and then as an actor, and in part because of an abhorrence of the Jim Crow or US apartheid system, which in some ways was comparable to apartheid in South Africa, uh, he fled the United States along with his spouse. And from the early 1920s until the late 1930s, he was living in exile in London. Interestingly enough, it was on, in London that he first gained a kind of global recognition he gained, gained global recognition because of his, his interpretations of Shakespeare's Othello, because of certain film roles. Although, to be fair, uh, some of his film roles were, even his own estimation, uh, not appealing, which caused him to abandon cinema altogether for concert singing and for the stage as an actor. And a turning point in his life took place in the early 1930s when a man who was to influence him rather deeply, speaking of another Black lawyer by the name of William Patterson. You may recall I wrote a biography about William Patterson called Black Revolutionary. He was a leading member of the US Communist Party, but he intersects Robeson's life who he had known previously, because Patterson was the leader of the campaign to free the political prisoners known as the Scottsboro Nine. Uh, these were nine Black youth in Jim Crow, Alabama, who were arrested improperly for alleged and purported sexual molestation of two Euro-American women. Uh, this was a frequent charge during the era of Jim Crow, uh, leading often and frequently to lynchings, lynching meaning execution, oftentimes in a communal and a festive manner, with Euro-Americans of various class backgrounds a gathering as the victim or victims were strung from a tree and hung and executed. You may be familiar uh, with the song uh, popularized by the singer, the chanteuse, uh, Billy Holiday, called Strange Fruit, which talks about lynching, which was quite common in the United States before the retreat of Jim Crow. In any event, it's Patterson who influences Robeson to use his talent and his resources, not only on behalf of the Scottsboro Nine, but also it's Patterson who helps to attract Robeson to the left. That is to say, to an affinity, not only with socialism, but to an affinity with the international communist movement, uh, which had been in a sense inaugurated in 1917 with the Russian Revolution, which led to the formation of communist parties in various countries, including the United States of America. At the same time that he was being influenced to the left, Robeson made a fateful trip to Nazi Germany. And that chilled him, that terrified him, and it also energized him. And from that point forward in the 1930s to his death in 1976, his primary self-definition was as an anti-fascist. 
In that regard, he also was on the front lines during the Civil War in Spain in the mid 1930s, where a progressive government was being destabilized by Mussolini in it Italy and Hitler in Germany. And Robeson sang for the besieged troops in Spain in the 1930s, Rose raised money for them as well. It was also in London that he came into contact with an array of Pan-African luminaries, including uh, Jomo Kenyatta, who went on, as you know, to become a founding father of today's Kenya, although it's fair to say that the Kenyatta of the 1930s uh, barely resembled the Kenyatta of 1963 going forward when that East African nation came to independence. He worked alongside CLR James of Trinidad and Tobago as an actor in a drama about the great Haitian revolutionary, speaking of Toussaint Louverture. He became acquainted with Kwame Nkrumah, the founding father of modern Ghana, Ghana coming to independence in 1957. And Robeson might have lived on in London, but for the fact that in 1939, World War II, in a sense, was incited uh, in Europe. And you may have seen the scenes from London uh, after the war began with many citizens or subjects, I should say, in London uh, sleeping in subways because of bombs shot from Germany uh, landing in crowded London cities. And so Robeson decided that the better part of wisdom was to return to the United States uh, circa 1939, 1940, uh, which he did with his spouse and his young son, Paul Jr. By the time he had returned, it was not unusual to suggest that the United States and Robeson were on the same page politically. What I mean by that is that by June 22nd, 1941, uh, Hitler and Berlin had invaded the Soviet Union. By December 7th, 1941, you had the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, not far distant from where I'm sitting as I speak. And that helped to initiate a kind of anti-fascist war. That is to say, the United States and the Soviet Union and Great Britain aligned against Mussolini and Hitler and Tojo in Japan. Robeson, at that particular moment, as suggested, was on the same page as the United States as a whole. Uh, insofar as he was an anti-fascist, the United States was fighting an anti-fascist war. The United States, including President Roosevelt and the White House, encouraged Hollywood to make uh, pro-Soviet movies. If you go on YouTube, uh, you can watch one of them entitled Mission to Moscow, which portrays the now reviled, at least reviled in Washington, uh, Soviet leader Joseph Stalin, as a hero to his people, portrayed rather benevolently, in fact. And that was the atmosphere in the United States up until about 1945. But at that point, as you know, World War II ended with the victory in Europe in May 1945, the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan in August 1945. And shortly thereafter, you see the United States uh, do a 180 degree reversal from a kind of anti-fascism and at least anti-anti-communism to becoming a leader in the anti-communist movement. Uh, that is to say that Robeson no longer was on the same page as the US, or perhaps I should say the US ruling class, and as a result was persecuted. 
there was a successful attempt to take his passport and prevent him from traveling overseas. There were attempts on his life uh, more than once. His income fell from the six figures to the low four figures. His records were very difficult to find in stores. He found it difficult to rent halls to perform in. And this was part of a very important transition by US imperialism. What I mean by that is that Washington found it difficult to compete in the ideological contestation with the socialist camp and the Soviet Union as long as it tolerated and promoted apartheid or Jim Crow. On 1954 its... compromise, right? Sorry to interrupt. Exactly. I've, I've yeah. termed this the compromise of 1954, whereby in return for an erosion of Jim Crow, the left leadership of the Black community was tossed overboard. Not only Robeson, but Claudia Jones of Trinidad and Tobago, uh, who was deported and wound up in London, where she became a leader of the Black London community. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, who was a close comrade uh, of Robeson. William Patterson, the aforementioned, who Robeson collaborated with in filing a genocide petition at the United Nations against the United States for committed genocide against Black people. You may be familiar with the invoking of the Genocide Convention by exactly. the South African government. Exactly, and we do have a sorry to interrupt. We do have a question on the 1954 uh, compromise. That's one of the questions that we had uh, for you today. Okay. So Go we right can ahead. Discuss it later on. Uh, I actually, you've answered to many of the questions that you already had. So maybe uh, for some of the responses, it's going, it's going to be uh, shorter. So the second question that we had, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful background that you gave us on the life of Paul Robeson. So the second question was uh, about the uh, turning point that you've already mentioned, meaning his life uh, in London. So Paul Robeson first sailed to England in 1922. So that's a trip that would be a turning point in his life. So I wanted to ask you if you could if you could talk about and it's already cited by the way if you could talk about the significance of his uh, experience in the UK, both for his career and political activism. Well, for many Black Americans, leaving the United States is like a breath of fresh air. Even if one goes to another capitalist country. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not even sure if Black people, and certainly I'm not sure if the international community realizes the depth of the opprobrium that is heaped upon Black Americans. It not only is tied to the anti-Blackness that stems from enslavement and the anti-Blackness that stems from colonialism, it also has something to do with the fact that when slavery was abolished in this country, the slave owners were not compensated. Unlike in London, where slavery was abolished in Jamaica, Barbados, et cetera, in the 1830s, up until a few years ago, the descendants of slave owners were still being compensated. When slavery was abolished in what is now Haiti, by the 1820s, uh, Haiti had to pay compensation to the slave owners, which has crippled that economy to this very day. The slave owners were not compensated in the United States, and that led to a continuing hatred of the lost investments, the lost fortunes that were revealed when slavery was abolished. And so uh, this infects every pore of the society of the United States. And so when Robeson went to London, he was able to escape to a certain degree that poisonous context. Now, let me also say that I'm speaking particularly of Black Americans. I'm not speaking of Jamaicans in London or Nigerians in London or even Papuans in London. I'm speaking of uh, Black Americans because one of the things you will also find is that nations who have a grievance against the United States, and keep in mind that for a good deal of the 19th century, Great Britain and London were in conflict. They fought a war in 1812, 
in which the White House was torched and the president sent into the streets. They clashed in, in Hawaii, for example. If you look at the Hawaiian flag uh, to this very day, it resembles the Union Jack. And so London tried to carry favor with Black Americans in order to gain leverage over the United States, just like the Iranians after the Iranian Revolution. They tried to carry favor with the United States when they students seized the embassy. They released Black American hostages, for example. So this is a, a, a well-known uh, point. It's a well-known Achilles heel of US imperialism. So when London, uh, when Paul Robeson arrived in London, uh, he felt liberated to a certain degree. Uh, he said that it was London that he first began to feel humane. And of course, that accelerated once he visited the Soviet Union. And I could go on a, a, another peroration about the differences between how Russia and the Soviet Union have treated Black people as opposed to the United States of America. And so uh, Robeson quickly established a sterling reputation as a singer and an actor uh, in London, and as noted, would have stayed there indefinitely but for the onset of World War II. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hunt, for that response. So the third question will be asked by my co-host, uh, Leonardo, joining you from South Africa. Uh, thank you for that. Uh... Uh, Comrade Buna. Uh, it's very interesting, uh, the points that you mentioned, um, Professor Horn. Um, one thing I definitely also do understand is that um, Paul Robeson was, uh, was very traveled, um, which leads me to speak on this. What is really impressive about uh, Paul Robeson was his excellent command of several languages. In your biography of the revolutionary artist, you describe at length how he would spend entire days learning foreign languages, a real passion for him. He considered singing a hobby. Can you elaborate on why learning foreign languages was so important to Paul Robeson and how his linguistic skills helped him in his artistic career as well as his political commitments? Well, thank you for that question. Um, Paul Robeson spoke numerous languages, most of the European languages. Of course, he was fluent in Russian. Uh, he felt that if you spoke to people in their own tongue, that they would be more willing to listen to what you're saying. And so at one point before a concert in Oslo, Norway, he began to study Norwegian so that he could speak to those who came to his concert in the Norwegian language and in fact sing uh, in the Norwegian language as well. Uh, this was also part of a political project in the sense that Robeson, like many Black revolutionaries in the United States, and I dare say Black revolutionaries worldwide, recognized that the struggle was a global struggle and that in order to win allies and friends for Black Americans and indeed for anti-imperialism, uh, it would be quite useful to be fluent in multiple languages because once again, that would help to win allies and win friends. Robeson oftentimes said that if he had not embarked on the path that he took, he could have easily become a professor of philology, that is to say a professor of the study of languages, because that is what intrigued him, that is what interested him intellectually. As you said, uh, he saw of studying languages as a kind of hobby and as a kind of uh, application as well. And I've come to find that uh, this tendency of Robeson has not been unique to him. Uh, for example, as noted, I'm, I'm out here in the Pacific. 
and uh, looking at the roots of US imperialism. And so I've had occasion to look at the life of the hero of the Philippines of the early 20th century, speaking of Jose Rizal, R-I-Z-A-L, uh, who spoke many languages like ropes and including Russian, uh, including Asian languages to, to numerous to mention. So I think that that's part I'm afraid to say of what we have lost with regard to the onset of the anti-communist era, the inauguration of the compromise of 1954, which tended to destabilize the left. That is to say that it not only had political consequences, it had intellectual consequences. It had consequences with regard to this past tendency illustrated by Robeson of becoming fluent in multiple languages so that he could influence a multiple nationalities. Yeah, oh, that's a that's a great point, um, Professor. Fluent to influence. Yeah. Um, on the next question, um, Professor Horn, um, I want to quickly we want to quickly discuss um, World War Two. Robeson reluctantly leaves Europe and returns to the U.S. Um, another turning point in Paul Robeson's life was the rise of fascism in Europe, which eventually led to World War II. Can you explain the impact of World War II on Paul Robeson's career and his image in the U.S.? Well, as noted, the World War II as far as the United States was concerned, was initiated on December 7th, 1941, with the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, the US colony by Japanese forces. Of course, I will not digress to explain the complicated relations between Hawaii, Japan, and the United States, but suffice it to say that that uh, helped to enticed the United States to, in turn, declare war on Japan. And then that, in turn, led Germany to declare war on the United States, which then launches World War II. Uh, as noted, uh, in the early stages of this conflict, uh, Robeson was viewed benignly by the US ruling class because they were united in their political determination to defeat Berlin and to defeat Japan. Uh, let me make a footnote here, which allows me to refer to a book I published uh, some years ago called Facing the Rising Sun, uh, African-Americans and Japan and the Rise of Afro-Asian Solidarity. Because when Robeson signed on to support the United States during World War II, your audience should know that there were many Black Americans. And in fact, uh, I even allude to this with regard to South Africa, um, some in South Africa who were sympathetic to Japan because Japan had tried to curry favor uh, with what used to be called the darker races and was not unsuccessful in that regard. Although it's fair to say that the overtures that Japan made to black people in the United States uh, struck a chord mostly with black nationalists. Uh, for example, Elijah Muhammad, who is considered a kind of patron saint of today's nation of Islam, which is a uniquely US uh, Islamic grouping, uh, he served time in prison because of reluctance to fight uh, in World War II against Japan. In any case, uh, Robeson's career in the United States blossomed from 1941 to 1945. His income, as I noted, was in the six figures. Uh, the kind of bar boycotts and persecution that he faced post-1945 was generally absent from the time he arrived on these shores, circa 1940, 41, up until the conclusion of World War II in 1945 with the 
atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. All right. Uh, thank you for that, um, Professor. Um, um, we're going to move on to our next question. Um, so our next question um, is going as follows. Um, the chapter titled Comrades and Friends, uh, the personal political world of Paul Robeson, which you wrote for a collective book on Paul Robeson published in 1998. 100 years after Robeson's birth, you wrote that Paul Robeson was no doubt a brilliant individual. However, he did not grow to political and intellectual maturity alone. He was the tallest tree in our forest, but he was far from being the only tree in that forest. Can you talk about the people who influenced the political and ideological trajectory of Paul Robeson? Sure. Uh, I've already made reference to William Patterson, uh, a Black lawyer and communist with roots in the Caribbean, as far as his father is concerned. He was born in San Francisco, California, circa 1890, died in New York City, circa 1980. Uh, he too was a lawyer. Uh, as noted, he led the defense, the worldwide defense of the Scottsboro Nine, which led to a significant retreat of the more horrible aspects of Jim Crow. Uh, he was a significant ideological and political influence on Robeson. I could also mention Benjamin Davis Jr. I wrote a biography about Benjamin Davis Jr., which you can easily find, entitled Black Liberation Red Scare, uh, Benjamin Davis and the Communist Party. Uh, he too was a lawyer, a graduate of Harvard Law School. Uh, his father was a member of the Atlanta Black elite, in fact, the Davis family and the family of Martin Luther King Jr. were quite close. You may recall that uh, in the late 1950s, Martin Luther King Jr. was stabbed during a visit to Harlem, New York, USA. Uh, he was rushed to the hospital. Benjamin Davis came to his bedside and he gave blood to Martin Luther King, so Martin Luther King could live. And of course, that led to the rather laughable idea that Dr. King had communist blood flowing in his veins, which was used to discredit him. Benjamin Davis Jr. was also an influence on Paul Robeson. Uh, I could have mentioned uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, born in Massachusetts in 1868, dying in Ghana, West Africa in 1963, a founder of the NAACP, the National Association for Advancement of Colored People, an intellectual. His book, Black Reconstruction, is still worth reading. A playwright, a novelist, a political activist, he and Robeson worked together in the Council on African Affairs, formed in the late 1930s, as a US-based grouping campaigning against colonialism and apartheid on the African continent. Uh, I could have mentioned Claudia Jones, uh, born in Trinidad uh, circa 1915, becoming also a leader of the US Communist Party before being deported, where she winds up in London as a leader of the Black uh, British community helping to found the newspaper, the West Indian Gazette. So these were some of the political and ideological influences uh, on uh, Paul Robeson. And I, of course, should not neglect to mention his spouse, Eslanda Robeson, who has also been the subject of a biography, not least because of her own political capabilities. For example, she was a well-known journalist, well-known traveler, and uh, she helped to influence Robeson, as noted, to abandon the law for 
concert singing in the stage and remained a deep and profound influence upon on him until her unfortunate passing in 1965. Thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Hurt. So uh, the next question will be on the anti-colonial and pan-African commitments of Paul Robeson. Um, so Paul Robeson acknowledged, and I think we've also mentioned it briefly, uh, that one of his major mistakes was his role in Sanders of the River, a movie which, according to many critics, including his friend Ben Davis, uh, one of his closest friends that we've just made reference to, uh, so according to the critics, uh, this uh, movie, Sanders of the River, extolled the virtues of British imperialism. So despite that setback uh, in his Pan-African commitments, Paul Robinson was a fierce and uncompromising anti-colonial and Pan-Africanist fighter. Paul Robinson was indeed one of the founders and de facto leader of the Council of African Affairs, which, uh, and here I'm quoting your book, was founded in 1937 to raise awareness about colonialism in Africa and to push for its demise. For Robeson, uh, supporting the struggle of Africans on the continent against colonialism, I should say Africans on the continent and also in the Caribbean, uh, against colonialism was all the more crucial as we considered that independent African states and independent Caribbean states would be in a better position to pressure the US government into ending the egregious treatment of African Americans. And once again, we've already mentioned that briefly, and in 1950, the Civil Rights Congress, an organization that Robeson was a member of, filled a petition at the UN charging the US government with genocide against African Americans. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on the links between Paul Robeson's support to anti-colonial struggles of African and Caribbean peoples and nations, and his involvement in the anti-Jim Crow movement, two struggles that, at least in his views, were interconnected and complementary. Well, the story begins, in a sense, in London uh, with his familiarity with Jomo Kenyatta and with his study as a result of a number of African languages, including uh, Kiswahili. Robeson was also, as noted, quite familiar with C.L.R. James, the Trinidadian intellectual and writer, uh, I recommend his book to this very day, The Black Jacobins, which is a stirring account of the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, which was a landmark, not only in the struggle against slavery, not only in the struggle against colonialism and settler colonialism, but given the fact that an unpaid sector of the working class, speaking of the enslaved, were able to overthrow their bondage. Uh, this ignited a general crisis of the entire slave system that could only be resolved with this collapse, including in the Caribbean and in North America uh, shortly thereafter. And this was also a blow in favor of people who have to sell their labor for a wage, that is to say, it was a blow in favor of the entire working class, not just the unpaid sector of the working class. As noted, Robeson went on from there to help to found the Council on African Affairs, which raised money for liberation movements, not only in South Africa, uh, but uh, throughout the continent. It pressured the United States government to change its policy towards the so-called colonial masters in Paris, London, uh, Brussels, and elsewhere. He also, as noted, worked with the Civil Rights Congress, which focused mostly on domestic issues, that is to say issues domestic, domestic in the United States of America, uh, particularly lynching, uh, the, this execution of Black men in particular without due process of law. Uh, it also focused on, focused on cases of political repression and persecution. Uh, for example, his close comrades, uh, William Patterson and Ben Davis and Claudia Jones uh, served time in prison because of political reasons. W.E.B. Du Bois was indicted in 1951 at the age of 83 
on charges of being an agent of an unnamed foreign power, a oblique reference to the then Soviet Union, because he was campaigning against the existence of nuclear weapons, and that was seen as a measure designed to benefit the Soviet Union, that is to say calling for the abolition of nuclear weapons, was seen as communist propaganda. Du Bois, fortunately, was able to escape prison. So Robeson was a stellar fighter uh, on behalf of anti-colonialism. He spent a considerable amount of time in Jamaica, which in many ways has been a leader of the anti-racist, anti-colonial struggle in the uh, Caribbean. Uh, he, of course, was quite supportive of the Cuban Revolution, January 1st, 1959, which was also a landmark in terms of the struggle against uh, global imperialism. So Robeson's life uh, serves as a testament to the viability and the importance of anti-colonialism because his life exemplified anti-colonialism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Horn, for that. So talking about uh, anti-colonialism, I wanted to um, address uh, Paul Robeson's uh, role in the anti-apartheid struggle. So to illustrate his contribution to the anti-apartheid struggle, I would like to quote a paragraph, which is quite long, as you know it, uh, from your book, uh, the biography you wrote about Paul Robeson. So the artist are revolutionary. Um, this book I'm showing again, also in French, for those who want to, uh, are interested in getting a copy. So you say, uh, Robeson's Harlem based newspaper, Freedom, was one of the few periodicals, even among Negro journalists, that highlighted the anti apartheid struggle, placing Nelson Mandela on the front page as early as October 1952, and including messages from his comrade, so Nelson Mandela's comrade, Walter Sisulu thanking U.S. Negroes, meaning those like Paul Robeson, for support. In turn, Sisulu and Mandela's future cellmate, Ahmad Katadwa, of the South African Indian Congress, sharp, sharply criticized the denial of Robeson's passport, observing that in this country, meaning South Africa, you would be discriminated against under our apartheid laws and treated as inferior, but we, the people, will welcome you with all our hearts. Who first of the South African Communist Party echoed these words, informing Robeson supporters, I support you, so here I'm quoting you first, I support you every inch of the way, we will do what we can here. And the last section of the paragraph, you write that Robeson's star was not altogether diminished, at least not in Harlem, was revealed when a few we weeks later, he spoke to a rally of 5,000 five, 5, at the 126th Street and Lennox Avenue. The issue bringing so many together was South African apartheid. Picketers also descended upon that nation's consulate, while at the same moment, 15,000 marched in Johannesburg to the tune of Robeson singing. There, Mandela, Sisulu, Moses, Kotane, and other stalwarts gathered. I am very proud, Beam Robeson, that those African brothers and sisters of ours play my records as they march in their parish. So this is on page. 135 of the artists as revolutionary. So Paul Robeson's name is seldom mentioned among the historical figures of the anti apartheid struggle, although your book suggests that he played a significant role in the fight against white supremacy and colonialism in South Africa. So the question that I have, are, uh, how do you explain that gap? Uh, and the hypothesis is, uh, is it because he passed away in January 1976, meaning a few months before the Soweto massacre in June 1976, which has largely contributed to the intensification and internationalization of the anti apartheid struggle. Well, that may have something to do with it, but once again, uh, I think in order to understand why Paul Robeson is not better known, one has to understand that the country of his birth, speaking of the ruling class of the country of his birth, has had a material interest 
in terms of distorting his record and burying his record because what Robeson stood for, including socialism and anti-imperialism and anti-fascism in the first instance, was inimical to the long-term goals and ambitions of the US ruling class and the folks who as of now administer uh, this territory. As noted, uh, he was a founder of the Council on African Affairs. And as I talk about in this book and as I've written elsewhere, the Council on African Affairs was forced into a split in the late 1940s as the Red Scare and the Cold War were gaining altitude. What happens is that an erstwhile comrade of Robeson and Du Bois, who also was part of the Council on African Affairs, I'm speaking of Max Jurgen, Y-E-R-G-A-N, uh, decided to take the anti-communist path and try to purge Robeson and Du Bois from the Council on African Affairs. Now, Jurgen was a man of the left up until that point. He, in fact, had lived in South Africa. And in fact, uh, as I say in my book on Southern Africa, uh, he was an influence from the left on Govan Mbeki, M-B-E-K-I, who you may recall as the father of Thabo Mbeki, the president of South Africa after Mandela's single term. And Govan Mbeki also was a long-term prisoner on Robben Island with Mandela. And of course, uh, they represented, uh, shall we say, uh, delicately contrasting ideological streams within the anti-apartheid movement. And those ideological streams in South Africa uh, still exist to a certain degree. And so Max Jurgen turned against Robeson, uh, became a supporter of apartheid, believe it or not, after a previous association uh, with both the South African Communist Party and the US Communist Party. Robeson had an opportunity to follow Jurgen, but chose not to do so. And in fact, uh, as I say in the Southern Africa book, uh, Mandela considered Robeson a kind of hero. After all, Robeson was about 20 years older than Mandela, that is to say from a different generation, and kept a picture of um, Robeson on his wall at home which was noted by a number of visitors. And so this was emblematic of this close relationship between those who labored under the ravages of Jim Crow and those who labored under the ravages of apartheid. Unfortunately, uh, the compromise of 1954, Afra mentioned, helped to disrupt that alliance between Black folk in North America and their counterparts and peers in Southern Africa. And I think that that was to the detriment of both sides. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, that point. Uh, so now we'd like to talk about the repression uh, against Paul Robinson. We've already uh, uh, glossed over uh, the, the different kinds of repression that he suffered. But before discussing how that repression materialized, and I think you've also you've already mentioned the fact that his passport was taken, his residence already. But before we discuss how that repression materialized, we'd like to ask you a question about the roots of the wage, the, the U.S. ruling classes wage against uh, people like Robeson. And you've mentioned your book on Southern Africa, which I'm going to show again here, White Supremacy Confronted. I found an intriguing footnote, just a footnote, but I would like to share with the audience as it helps explain my view how why the US ruling class was so determined to crush the ideals that Paul Robinson embodied. So the, the footnote is quite long, but I'm going to put it here quite extensively. Uh, just one is on page 50, uh, page nine, sorry, of the this book. So you say, uh, of course, the threshold question is why anti communism peppered with racism was so appealing to the US ruling class. 
Though often forgotten, it was the U.S. elite that endured one of the largest expropriations of private property without compensation in world history in 1875 when investment in enslaved Africans was nullified. The socialism which communists promised was through the uh, was was thought to be mean more expropriation. When Paul Robeson, who also happened to be a fluent, a fluent speaker of Russian, sorry, zoomed to the forefront of the struggle for socialism, this fear of what socialism was thought to portend metastasized. And this was occurring in the context of a nation where the fiercest class struggle historically had been that between uh, had been that between the enslaved and the slaveholders, culminating in a debacle for the latter, with the struggle now featuring Robinson leading to, to a result exceeding 18, 1865 exponentially or so it was thought. To that extent, communism was the logical response by anti-communism, sorry, was the logical response by Washington and Wall Street to the threat they perceived they were facing. When Robinson came, became to be, to the, uh, sorry, when Robeson became the most visible champion of anti-apartheid struggle in which communists played a ruling role, this enhanced the ineffable tie between white supremacy and anti-communism. Unfortunately, the understable focus on race in discussing the torturous relation that was enslavement has obscured too frequently the similarly explosive class aspects. Okay, so based on this uh, uh, diagnosis that you make, I would like to ask you if uh, do you think, is it fair to say that many anti-racist and anti-imperialist activists, including those you call our so-called friends on the left, uh, do you think that they have misdiagnosed the trauma that the abolition of slavery has been for the U.S. ruling class and how determined that U.S. ruling class has become to prevent another traumatic episode by, and I would even say by any means necessary to paraphrase Malcolm X? Well, I, I think so. I, I think that to look at the population of the enslaved as a class, that is to say, as an unpaid sector of the working class, it helps to expose and reveal the ideological weaknesses of some of our friends on the left uh, who ignore the class question when it comes to looking at Black people. And of course, we should not denigrate or dismiss the race question. Uh, that is to say that uh, certainly it's fair to suggest that uh, racism, for example, today is something that afflicts Black people of whatever class background from which they may emerge, even though overwhelmingly and disproportionately, we're still a working class community. I would say 90% of the black community in the United States is a working class community. And the black community in the United States being a working class community tends to be pro-union. It's the sector, the demographic sector in the United States that's most prone to join unions, most prone to oppose anti-union activities. And before the Compromise of 1954, this tendency was a tendency that was exported abroad. I think it helps to undergird and help us to analyze the compatibility between the struggle in South Africa and Southern Africa generally, and the struggle in North America. But unfortunately, uh, this rather elementary point has oftentimes been neglected. And I think it also sheds light on why the US ruling class uh, felt that it had to retreat from the more horrible aspects of US apartheid, the more horrible aspects of US racism because it was handicapping the United States in its ideological contestation with the then Soviet Union and the socialist camp. Not only that, even before 1917, as I said, I'm, I'm out here in uh, Honolulu, and there was a lot of contestation in the 19th century uh, between London and Washington. 
uh, globally. And London was scoring points repeatedly against Washington by telling the indigenous Hawaiian community, many of whom were rather dark skinned, uh, many of whom resemble the Melanesian population, although they're considered to be, quote, Polynesian, London was scoring points by suggesting that if the Hawaiian kingdom allowed US influence, they would be enslaved ultimately by the US interlopers and visitors. And so that too put pressure on the United States in order to gain more global influence to try to do something about slavery. And so there has been a historic intersection between the fate of black people in the United States and the state of the world. And one of the things that we've lost in recent times is an ignoring of the global correlation of forces, an ignoring of global conditions in terms of trying to understand what's happening to black people in the United States today. And I think that this is also a detriment to international peace and security, because when you removed black people from the international scene, you basically meant that the right wing, our, our historic opponents would be elevated and therefore in an advantageous position to wage war in Indochina and Korea and Afghanistan and Iraq in Grenada and Panama and Libya and in sites too numerous to mention. And so once again, I think that in order for us to build a better world, which is what I take it we're all about, we're gonna to have to change that particular formula whereby black people in the United States have been compelled to ignore what's going on in the world. And in return, uh, there's been a lack and a decline of solidarity globally with Black people's struggles here at home in North America. Wow, that's so interesting, Professor Horn. Um, so uh, Professor Horn, uh, as part of the Black scare, Red scare, Paul Robeson was repressed by the U.S. government officially because of his ties with the Soviet Union. He was suspected of being a member of the U.S. Communist Party. But the real reason was his anti-colonial and anti-Jim Crow advocacy. But Paul Robeson was also a collateral victim of what you've called the 1954 Compromise, whereby many African American leaders accepted to align with Washington's imperial policies in return of concession of the ruling US class on the most egregious aspects of US apartheid Jim Crow. In your biography of Robeson, you even argue that in this historic process, Robeson played the role of a sacrificial lamb. I would also recommend to your audience a piece you wrote in October 22, entitled For African Americans, Employing a Radical Internationalist Perspective is Not a Luxury, but a Necessity. The piece is available on the website of Black Agenda Report. Could you please elaborate on the impact of Paul Robeson's repression, not only for the revolutionary artist himself, but also on African Americans' engagement with international questions? Well, first of all, a little background. Um, because the balance of forces in North America historically has been so hostile to Black people, going back to the bad old days of slavery, it has been necessary for us to make progress by lengthening, lengthening the battlefield, by appealing to allies abroad. This also has something to do with another concept that 
sadly enough, has been unrecognized, including by our friends on the left. I'm speaking of the phenomenon known as settler colonialism. Now, it's very interesting that in light of Israeli depredations in Gaza, there has been considerable attention to the phenomenon known as settler colonialism. And it has awakened many in the United States to the reality that the United States has been a settler colonial regime. After all, you had Europeans invading centuries ago, liquidating the indigenous population. Uh, I talk about this at length in my book, The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of U.S. Fascism, because Texas, uh, the second most populous state, was probably a leader in terms of genocide against Native American groupings. And settler colonialism involved class collaboration between and amongst European settlers. That is to say, poor European settlers felt that if they collaborated with the European settler elite, they could gain Native American land and with a little bit of luck and a lot of pluck, uh, they could also employ, quote unquote, free African labor and thereby become rich, wealthy, and live the so-called American dream. And so to fast forward to the US Civil War, uh, it's quite striking that during that war from 1861 to 1865, the army, the military, of the slave owners was comprised disproportionately of poor European settlers because they thought it was in their interest to fight to preserve slavery. Now, in the short term, you can make an argument that they were fighting to preserve a system of slavery that undercut their wages and working conditions because it's very difficult for a paid worker to compete with an unpaid worker. It's very difficult for a carpenter who is paid to compete with a carpenter who is unpaid. And yet these poor European settlers felt that they could benefit from preserving this system of enslaving of Africans. And likewise, you cannot understand US politics today in 2024 without understanding this concept of class collaboration between and amongst European settlers across class lines and their descendants, of course. And this reality was tacitly understood by Paul Robeson. That's why he studied languages in a maniacal fashion in order to become fluent so that he could appeal overseas, across the Atlantic and across the Pacific and across the waters for allies, for Black Americans. That's why he started the Council on African Affairs. That's why he filed a petition at the United Nations. He saw it as necessary to gain international support uh, at the United Nations for the struggle of Black people here in the United States of America. But alas, what has happened since the so-called compromise of 1954 is that many of our leaders and organizations have found it necessary to retreat from the international barricades. And this has been a detriment for our movement and helps to explain why even certain liberals today in the United States, not to mention numerous outside observers, are suggesting that the United States might be on the verge of fascism. And that is a reality that not only I should not ignore, I think that people outside of the United States should not ignore because fascism will bring war and war will be visited upon peoples, not only within the United States, but people outside of the United States. Uh, thank you for that, Professor Horn. Um, so, Professor Horn, Paul Robeson died 
in Philadelphia in 1976, 11 years after his wife, Eslanda. His revolutionary life and career has inspired anti-colonial and pan-African activists in Africa and throughout the diaspora. To conclude this session, we would like to ask you how the legacy of Paul Robeson can help us to overcome some of the major challenges faced by people of African descent across the globe. These challenges in include the new Red Scare as illustrated by the attacks against the African People's Socialist Party, Uhuru Movement, Chairman Omali Yeshitela and his comrades in the US, the persistence of racism and systematic discrimination against people of African descent, and the recolonization of the African continent, AFRICOM and France Afrique. Well, I think Robeson's legacy is monumentally important in terms of preparing us for the bitter struggles that are just around the corner. Uh, first of all, the easy response is that Robeson's multilingualism needs to be studied and emulated. Uh, and I would say that's particularly the case in the United States of America, but not for the United States of America alone. I think that as Robeson recognized, a sure way or an easier way to win allies is to speak to them in their own tongue, to speak to them in the language that they speak. Second of all, I think that Robeson's internationalism, which was a complement to his multilingualism, needs to be emulated not only in the United States of America, but outside of the United States of America, uh, because the problems that we face increasingly are not domestic. Uh, you think, for example, of climate change, for example. Uh, that is a transnational phenomenon that's going to require international collaboration and international cooperation, uh, not to mention the fact that working class people, and of course the black community in the United States is disproportionately working class and indeed the black community in South Africa is disproportionately working class and the black community in France is disproportionately working class. And historically, a surefire way for the working class to advance has been through international cooperation, through international collaboration. Reference here, my earlier comment about the impact of the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, a successful revolt of the unpaid sector of the working class and the beneficial aspect that had, not only on the unpaid sector of the working class in the Americas, but also on the working class as a whole in the Americas as well. And I would also say that in that regard, we need to heighten the focus on organizing unions, unions of working class people, because that is how we galvanize and mobilize our strength. That is why, that is how we're able to fund uh, different initiatives, for example, fund initiatives in the United States against police terror. And it also helps us to develop what should be another priority, uh, which is the development of alternative political parties. Because at least in the United States, and I dare say in many other advanced capitalist countries, the working class oftentimes is trapped in political parties that are not necessarily dominated by the working class. They're oftentimes dominated by the petty bourgeoisie, dominated by the big buck bourgeoisie, dominated by the ruling class. And uh, 
it's difficult to put it mildly for working class objectives and goals to be realized once you we are trapped in political parties that are not led by the working class and we all know that what the working class is able to gain on the picket line what the working class is able to gain by strikes withholding our labor oftentimes we can lose in the legislature <laughs> because our interests are not necessarily represented in the legislature so this is only a partial agenda uh, for an explanation an elaboration and elucidation of the legacy of the great late Paul Robeson. But I do think these are baby steps towards understanding what he left us when he passed away in January 1976. Thank you very much, Dr. Horn, for that great conclusion. So these are the questions that we have for you today. So is there anything you wanted to add before we go? Oh, hold on. Let me get this book and I'll just flash it. Hold on for a second. Yeah, no worries. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Okay, so this is the new book. Okay. And it has a collection of articles uh, up from, I've written over the decades, including uh, articles <laughs> on what I call left-wing white nationalism, which I think is a ruling ideology or an important ideology, I should say, in the United States of America. It has an analysis of the conflict between NATO and Russia, and the beginnings of a new international situation, uh, given the impending defeat of NATO on the battlefield of Ukraine. It, uh, it has an analysis of the lumpen, because in terms of class analysis, in the United States, we've had to pay considerable attention to the lump, uh, which may come as a surprise to many who have not uh, paid attention to this. I wish I'd included in this book uh, an article entitled, Who Lost the Cold War, Africans and African-Americans? But you can find that easily online. Yeah. So anyway, that's the latest book. Yeah, thank you very much for that. I think, I think it's not available yet in, in Europe. Last time I checked, they said it would be available uh, in, in March. So yeah, we're looking forward to reading that book. And I also advise, uh, recommend to the audience uh, the article that you've just made reference to. I think it's available on the website of Monthly Review uh, Report uh, Against Left Wing White Nationalism. Last time, I think I read it there. And uh, yeah, so we would like to thank you very much, Dr. Horn. So today we had, was a great conversation. We actually had people from different parts of the globe, of diaspora. We had people from Argentina, people from Colombia, people from sub Saharan Africa, Europe, North America. So we are very grateful to you uh, for being the vehicle that they, that brought so many people of the Af African diaspora together for for this lecture. Uh, I would also like to thank the team of the dedicated translators. So uh, Fernando, uh, Luna, Emily, uh, Lete, and Caroline, uh, who made the translation in French and Spanish. So the next session will be in March. The day will be shared with you soon, as soon as we confirm with Dr. Hearn. And we'll be, the next session will be dedicated to another figure of African liberation, unknown or unsung African uh, hero, uh, Shirley Graham Du Bois. Uh, so we're looking forward to having the next lecture on, in, in March, next month. And in the meantime, remember folks that history is more than trying to understand the past. History is also a weapon that helps understand the present and shape the glorious future. Obviously, this is not for me. This is a quote from the very people, from the very special guest that we had today, from the people's historian himself, Dr. Gerald Hone. So thank you, Dr. Hone, for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for, for listening. So the video will be uploaded on Activist News Network, I believe, uh, later uh, today. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.